Hi, my name is Rachel Colburn. I'm a psychologist here at the Learning Center. Today with my colleague, Andrew Harris, who is the Assistant Program Manager for Teen and Adult Services at MGH Aspire, we'll be talking about how to use apps to augment autism care. When Andrew and I first proposed doing this topic, we had originally planned on focusing on apps specifically for managing symptoms of anxiety and depression, as the talk title advertised. And we're still gonna talk about that. However, as we began researching this topic, we found that apps were changing so quickly, it was hard to make concrete recommendations. Additionally, given how different each person is, it's challenging to give one recommendation for an app because it may not resonate as strongly from one person to another. So instead, we've modified this topic somewhat. As I mentioned, we'll still talk about apps for managing symptoms of anxiety and depression, but we're really first going to focus on how to identify apps that may be helpful for you or your loved one. We'll talk about factors to think about when selecting an app, how to select an app, and then end with recommendations. Given that we had to change the format of this, we'll provide a handout that we will either email along with the presentation or will be provided as a link that you can access. We appreciate your flexibility during this time. We will begin with some thoughts ahead of our discussion to frame it. During our presentation today, we will focus on a parent's perspective, as typically that is the audience that attends these coffee combos. However, this can be easily applied to others. For example, those looking for apps themselves, providers seeking more fluency on the subject, and other caretakers including family members and friends. An important point that we want to highlight is that apps are a tool that can be used to augment or complement other kinds of treatment, but they should not be a replacement for treatment with a professional. Technology can be a very powerful tool in increasing access to supports and helping one carry out treatment recommendations. However, apps are not the treatment. They can support ongoing treatment, but cannot be used in place of treatment with a licensed provider. We want to emphasize a standalone app is not enough for behavior change. What apps can do, though, is offer reminders, such as to practice deep breathing daily, help one organize their treatment or just aspects of their day, help one become more engaged in treatment and motivated to participate, and support the work that is being done with a provider. Apps are becoming more and more sophisticated and can be accessed almost anywhere at any time, though there are thousands of apps out there purporting to be able to do so many things, and most of us don't have the time to go through all of these apps. Because not all technology is created equal, we want to briefly discuss what to look for when selecting an app. Most importantly, you want to match the app to the person. This includes first thinking about what skills your loved one is hoping to develop, do they want to increase their mindfulness, frustration tolerance, social engagement, use of coping skills? These are a few examples of skills that apps can help address. Another thing to consider is the age of the person using the app. Most apps will have a recommended age range. You can find this easily by looking at the information page of the app in the App Store, where it will have a category called Age Range. However, we encourage you to still explore the app yourself to make sure it's appropriate for your loved one, as chronological age does not always match developmental age, and these age ranges are generally a rough guideline. You should also consider whether the app aligns with your loved one's learning style. Is it interactive, like does it have games, videos, or audio? Does it have a specific theme that may match a special or restricted interest? Does it provide concrete examples or activities, and does it provide reminders? Many apps have push notifications that can help in reminding your loved one to engage with the app or practice a specific skill. The final thing to consider before beginning your search is to determine whether the app is engaging and fun. This may sound simple, but motivation to use an app for many people is tied to how much they actually like the app. If the app is not interesting, they're less likely to use it and reap the benefits. As I noted in the last slide, finding an app connected to a special interest or one that involves games and rewards can really increase motivation to use the app. Next, we wanted to walk you through a concrete example of selecting an app with a specific goal in mind. We hope that this example will allow you to better understand the different factors that might go into selecting an app and replicate the process using the worksheet that is linked in the comments below. The first, most important step is trying to define exactly what you hope the app will help you do. Be as specific as you can as you define your goal. Spending time now will streamline the process in later steps. Instead of just saying, 
I want an app that will help with anxiety, think about how an app might actually help you do that. If you don't know much about managing anxiety yet, your goal might be, I want an app that can teach me the basics of stress management and show me different things to try. If you instead know that you want to try meditation, you might say, I want to meditate, but I need some guided meditation and reminders. Other example goals that are getting more specific are listed here and on the worksheet. We thought it might be useful to share a concrete example of using this sheet. For our example, imagine that a parent is looking for an app to help their son who was recently diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. They are worried and they want to help him learn new skills to manage the many stressors in his life. They know a little bit about some of the ways that people manage stress like yoga and meditation, but don't feel like they know enough to teach their son themselves. They talk with his therapist and decide that they're going to look for an app that they can use along with their therapist's guidance. The next step in the process is likely the one that will take the longest. We need to spend time actually researching apps. Don't expect to be able to rush through this and hit the jackpot with the first app that you happen to stumble across. Again, slowing down during this step and consulting with other people will pay dividends in the long run. The good news here is that there are many people that spend a lot of time thinking about stuff like this. In the last five years that I have been looking at apps to supplement care, more and more high quality websites have popped up that curate lists of apps and make specific recommendations. It's definitely worth looking into these review sites. Additionally, we live in a very well-connected world. There are many communities on Facebook and other social media platforms that use the space to share resources and recommendations. Also, don't overlook the resources that you're already connected to. Teachers, therapists, counselors, and other professionals might have recommendations ready and at their fingertips. These recommendations could be really good if they already work with the person that you're trying to support. Don't feel like you're the sole investigator. Connect with these people and ask for help. Now back to our example case. Our parent has defined their goal as finding an app that they and their teenage son can use together to build a routine of stress management. Now it's time to hit the stacks and start some research. They start by looking at one of the websites recommended on the worksheet, commonsense.org. They find an app called Headspace that looks promising. To get as much information as possible, they reach out to their Facebook community and ask anyone if they've tried it. Next, our parent heads over to adaa.org, another site recommended on the handout. There, they find an app called Happify that has had some research done on it. Applications that are backed up by results are certainly worth looking into. So our parent goes online and looks around Happify's website. They find that there are a lot of doctors consulting on the app's development and feel like it's worth trying out as well. Our parent keeps researching, feeling better now that they found at least two apps that look promising. They try a basic Google search, and one of the top results is Stop, Breathe, Think. They like that this app also has a version for younger children and think about broadening their goal to include more of the family. They add this app to their list as well. While Googling, our parent also found another site that makes some recommendations. At aacap.org, they find an app called Calm. It's well-reviewed, so they add it to their list to try. At this point, our parent feels like they have enough apps to try out. They hit pause on the research step and get ready to move on to the next. I hope that the next step in the process is the most fun. Admittedly, it is also time consuming, but again, we feel like spending time in the decision-making process will help when it's time to actually start using the app. After finishing all of the research, it's time to actually try these apps out. Trying out an app doesn't mean spending hours on it. Instead, get a feel for it by exploring it, seeing what it can do, and trying out a few of the activities. You want to spend enough time to feel like you can make an informed decision. Sometimes this will happen quickly. Maybe you realize that the app requires way too much reading or is targeting an audience that feels too young. In this case, move on to trying out a different app and return to it if you change your mind after seeing some more. The worksheet can guide you through many of the criteria that we think are important when considering apps. In the end though, you will know what's important. Maybe ease of use is critical for you because you don't consider yourself too techy. Maybe you know your kid and you're sure they won't spend much time on an app if it's fundamentally just not fun. Think about which of the criteria on the worksheet are the most important to you. If there are criteria that don't matter much, don't let them weigh heavily on your decision-making process. As for our example parent, they are well aware that if the app isn't fun, their teenage son isn't going to use it for very long. Ideally, they'd like to find something that feels like a game or at least can incorporate some of their son's interests. They also know that anything that's really heavy on text is going to be viewed skeptically and hopes to find something that's more visual and includes videos. The parent also wants to prioritize results. 
A game that's fun but doesn't actually do anything to reduce stress or anxiety isn't worth spending time on. They hope to find something that's backed by research and has, set, has been shown to get results. Other factors aren't as important for our example parent. They have made room in the budget for this app and they are trying hard not to make decisions based on price. They also aren't terribly concerned about privacy because they're planning on setting up the account themselves. With their priorities set, the parent is ready to start looking at the apps. They spend some t of their time reading up on the apps online, watching tutorial videos, and reading more reviews. They rule out one app based on the tutorial videos and then download the rest to try them. Whenever possible, they use the limited free version of the app to get a feel for it without having to pay up front. On this slide, I wanted to share an example of how the parent might fill out one of the workspaces on the downloadable sheet. For this example, they were researching Headspace. They started by filling in some of the easy to find details like recommended age and price, and then went on to include their opinion on engagement and usability. If you're a copious note taker, you may want to have additional space to write notes that illuminate some of these broader categories more fully. By this point, you're getting close to the end of the process of picking out an app to use. The last variable, of course, is the person who will actually use the app. It's possible that all of your hard work pays off and the app is an immediate success, but it's likely that there is still some legwork to be done in supporting your child in actually using the app. Try to determine what level of support will be needed. With older children, you might support them by talking about why you're asking them to use it. For younger children, you might sit alongside them for a while while they learn it, asking questions and offering help. Some parents might opt to discuss having a therapist or teacher introduce the app. And unfortunately, if the app isn't working out as well as you had hoped for whatever reason, be prepared to reassess. For our example parent, they think about how they'll recommend using the app to their teen. They know that sometimes things that are presented as expectation or responsibilities can be felt as unfair by their son or lead to their teenage son pushing back. They opt instead to have a discussion first about why they're looking for an app and try to get buy-in for them to try something. They know their teen doesn't want to feel stressed all the time and they think that they could be motivated to address that under the right circumstances. They also decide that dictating which app will be used will be resisted. Instead, they opt to give their son some choice making two recommendations and keeping the conversation open. They also decide to wait for the right time to have the conversation and talk with their son's therapist about how to bring it up. Hopefully, after all of this planning, at this point in the process, you found an app that seems like a good fit and you've got some buy-in by the user. If things aren't going smoothly, try to take a couple steps back and look at what might be in the way. If possible, get feedback from the person using the app and see if challenges can be addressed. Even if things are going really well, it's good to stop and reflect from time to time. Have your needs changed? Is the app still challenging enough to enable growth? Think of this as an iterative process that requires some tweaking from time to time. Who knows? Maybe by the time you decide a change is in order, a cool new app will hit the market that you want to try out. Andrew alluded to this before, but we're going to touch again briefly on privacy and other concerns when using apps. It's really difficult to know how the developers of an app are using your personal information. Therefore, just be mindful of the information that you or your loved one is sharing. Also, consider whether the app allows for dual slash shared accounts, which will be denoted by the blue icon with an image of a family. You can see it here on the slide. Also, consider whether the app has a community forum and if it's regulated. And you can also see if an app has parental controls. For example, controls that allow you to limit a community forum option if that's a concern of yours. I know this is a lot of things to consider and the process might seem daunting. Thinking about everything from price to privacy to how fun something is, is a lot to balance. In the end, the two most important questions that you need to keep coming back to are, what do I hope using this app will help my loved one do? And does this app align with my loved one's personality, learning styles, and interests? There are lots of great communities and websites out there that can help you navigate the process. We'll be trying to share some of our own recommendations soon in the comments below. Reach out to others for support and ideas, and remember that although it might take time and effort, an app can be an amazing addition to the supports you already have in place. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit our virtual coffee conversation. We were both sad that we could not meet face to face, but I hope that having access to this video and the other resources will help you get started on exploring apps and how they can be used to augment autism care. Thank you again and good luck in your search.